today. We are delighted to have Bahariye Rohani Ma'ani speaking about the greatest holy leafs, indispensable services in the first decade of the formative age. This particular webinar is part of our ongoing series this year, commemorating the first year of Shoghi Effendi's guardianship of the faith, which of course began uh, in, well, technically late 21, but uh, really in early 1922, when he found out through the will and testament that he was the guardian. Turning now to our introduction to Bahariye herself, a truly amazing woman, and I've been really very delighted to have a chance to get to know her and have her make several presentations for the Wilman Institute. She was born in Shiraz. Um, her, her family had become Baha'is quite early on. She was the president of the Students' Council at her high school, which was a women's high school, then continued to study Persian literature at the University of Shiraz. Towards the end of the Nine, the Tenure Crusade, in other words, you know, late 50s, early 60s, she pioneered to Nairobi, where she married, and uh, 13 months later, her husband passed away there. Uh, she then was able to take some courses for credit there at the Department of Religion and Philosophy University College in Nairobi. After 11 years in Kenya, she moved to Haifa, where she served in various capacities for over 30 years, in fact, pushing on closer to 40 years from the looks of things here from 1971 to 2009. She's now in Washington, D.C., and she has published numerous papers and books. We have a course on the, um, the leaves of the twin divine trees, which is a book she published about the women in the households of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Today, of course, her talking about uh, Bahia Khanum, the greatest holy leaf, relates quite closely to that particular book. And she's also been quite an advocate about the role of women in the world and the importance of the equality of men and women uh, in the advancement of society and advancement of the Baha'i community for that matter. So without further ado, I will now turn this over to Bahariye. Bahariye, welcome to our webinar. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Rob, for this opportunity. I am always elated to talk about women, especially the greatest Holy Leaf. She was, she is really an amazing woman in the history of women in religion. Um, uh, greetings to everyone, Allah Abha. This slide that you are viewing right now has the photograph of Shoghi Effendi and the photograph of the greatest holy leaf set next to each other to indicate some of the contrasts, especially in age. When Abdul Baha passed away, Shoghi Effendi was 24 years old. The greatest holy leaf was 75 years old. As we all know, she was born Fatima, and Baha'u'llah later gave her his own name, Baha. The feminine form of it is Baha'iye, and the Bahiye and Baha'iye are used, and they are both correct. I usually refer to her as Baha'iye, like all the Persians do. She lived to be 86 years old, 80 years of it was spent in exile. Her life from childhood was dedicated to serving her family and the community. As I said, she was 75 years old when Abdul Baha passed away. And she spent the last decade of her life shielding Shoghi Effendi from real and potential threats and supporting his undertakings wholeheartedly. Now go to the next slide. The first decade of Shoghi Fandi's ministry coincided 
with the last decade of, of Baha'i Khanum's earthly life. During the first decade of his ministry, Shoghi Afendi faced the legal challenge to his authority by Mirza Muhammad Ali, who turned his back to Baha'u'llah's covenant by opposing Abdul Baha. Shoghi Afendi's declining health forced him to spend time abroad annually during the first few years of his ministry. Each of his absences lasted several months. The presence of a totally devoted and trusted representative like Baha'i Khanum was indispensable to the smooth running of the affairs of the community at home and abroad. Baha'i Khanum's main objectives during the last decade of her life were protecting Shoghi Afendi from the covenant breakers schemes, supporting his undertakings and ensuring his well-being. Her unconditional love for and wholehearted support of Shoghi Afendi's work set the example for the faithful to follow. In his book of the covenant, this, as you can see, the title of the slide is the mystery of succession in Baha'u'llah's book of the covenant. Because many people wonder how Mirza Muhammad Ali could have been in a position to oppose Abdul Baha and then rise against Shoghi Fendi. Baha'u'llah in his book of the covenant provides for two successors after him. The most mighty branch, or Abdul Baha, was the first to succeed Baha'u'llah. He was appointed the center of his father's covenant. The greater branch, Mirza Muhammad Ali, was second in line of succession. Had he remained faithful to the provisions of Baha'u'llah's covenant, he would have succeeded Abdul Baha. However, fearful of not living long enough to attain his leadership desire, he did everything in his power to discredit Abdul Baha in the hope of replacing him. Mirza Muhammad Ali's flagrant misdeeds included working with Abdul Baha's enemies to remove him, that's Abdul Baha, from the scene. He also engaged in interpolating Baha'u'llah's writings to undermine Abdul Baha's station. As a result of these and other flagrant misdeeds, Mirza Muhammad Ali became the archbreaker of Baha'u'llah's covenant and forfeited the right of succeeding Abdul Baha. Next is Baha'u'llah's Baha warning about Mirza Muhammad Ali. Mirza Muhammad Ali had certain proclivities from early youth. And uh, Baha'u'llah was well aware, obviously, of the kind of person that he was. In his youth, he claimed receiving divine revelation. That claim prompted some friends with whom he corresponded to ask, to ask Baha'u'llah about Mirza Muhammad Ali's station. Baha'u'llah revealed in a tablet. He, that's Mirza Muhammad Ali, he says, Verily is but one of my servants. Should he for a moment pass out from under the shadow of the cause, he surely shall be brought to naught.
in his will and testament, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the first part of which was written when the nefarious activities of Mirza Muhammad Ali and his supporters had peaked, Abdul Baha appointed Shoghi Effendi his eldest grandson, the guardian of the cause of God. This happened when it became clear and evident that Mirza Muhammad Ali was not fit to succeed Abdul Baha. And in fact, he had worked against his own interests and had become the archbreaker of Baha'u'llah's covenant. So when Abdul Baha appointed Shoghi Fandi to be the center of the cause after him, he confided in only one person, one of the believers who knew that Abdul Baha had appointed Shoghi Fandi. That was the greatest holy leaf, Baha Yekhanu, because he was the only one Abdul Baha could fully trust. Next, a well guarded secret. So the appointed of Shoghi Fandi was a well-guarded secret, which means no one else in the community knew that Abdul Baha had appointed Shoghi Fandi. And it was obviously for very good reasons, including security of Shoghi Fandi. And during his ministry, Abdul Baha, responded to two inquiries dealing with the question of succession. The Baha'is knew that the Mirza Muhammad Ali had broken the covenant and were some of them who had studied and knew that were eager to know whether Abdul Baha had appointed someone to, rip, to follow him, to succeed him. One of those questions the people, I think there were three believers from Iran who asked whether there would be any person to whom all the Baha'is would be called upon to turn after his succession. Abdul Baha wrote, as to the question you have asked me, know verily that this is a well-guarded secret. It is even as a gem concealed within its shell, that it will be revealed is predestined. The time will come when its light will appear, when its, uh, when its evidence will be made manifest and its secrets unravel. The other response that indicates the same thing, more or less, is a tablet he revealed in response to a question from Miss, Miss F. Drayton concerning the child mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. In response to her question, Abdul Baha says, O maid servant of God, verily, that child is born as and is alive, and from him will appear wondrous things that thou wilt hear of in the future. Thou shalt behold him endowed with the most perfect appearance, supreme capacity, absolute perfection, consummate power, and unsurpassed might. His face will shine with a radiance that illumines all the horizons of the world. Therefore, forget this not, as long as thou dost live in as much as ages and centuries will bear trace of him. In neither of these responses, Abdul Baha divulges the name of Shoghi Effendi. Next. 
All right, there we have the Baha'i world unaware of the identity of Abdul Baha's appointee. And when Abdul Baha passed away, nobody knew who he had appointed to follow him. It was so well guarded, the secret was so well guarded that when he passed away, members of the community, including members of his own family, except for the greatest holy leaf, were unaware who, had, who, had, who he had appointed to lead the Baha'i world after him. The best known faithful member of the Holy Family at the time was the greatest Holy Leaf. So although the believers didn't know who Abdul Baha had appointed to succeed him, they knew who the greatest Holy Leaf was. She was the best known member of the family. Why? Because she had served as Abdul Baha's incomparable deputy and vice gerent during his prolonged absence in the West. So she was, she was well placed to step forward and deal with matters of urgent nature immediately after Abdul Baha's ascension. This was probably one of the wisdoms that Abdul Baha actually prepared her by leaving her as his representative when he went on his long trip. Next. Actions taken immediately after Abdul Baha's ascension include what the greatest holy leaf did to keep Mirza Muhammad Ali at bay. The believers only had the greatest holy leaf to turn their eyes to because of the reasons explained in the earlier slide. So she steps forward and informs the Baha'i world of the ascension of Abdul Baha. Although she knew about Shoghi Pandi's appointment as the guardian of the cause, she did not initially disclose the information. Why? Probably because she wanted to inform Shoghi Pandi first and seek his guidance. According to Price Whisper, according to Amatul Baharu Yekhanom, Shoghi Pandi himself did not know that he was Abdul Baha's appointee. So the cable that the greatest holy leaf sent to uh, Major Tudor Paul in London received in the morning of November 29, 1921 reads, His Holiness Abdul Baha ascended Abha Kingdom, informed friends, greatest holy leaf. You see, the information she provides is very limited to the actual fact that Abdul Baha had passed away and nothing else. And we are going to we are going to the next slide. From Abdul Baha's passing to Shoghi Afandi's arrival. When Abdul Baha passed away, Shoghi Afandi was studying in England. 31 days intervened between his ascension and Shoghi Afandi's return to Haifa. During those days, during those ominous days, the greatest holy leaf took charge of the affairs of the faith protected the community at home and abroad from the machinations of the covenant breakers who tried every means available to them to install Mirza Muhammad Ali as Abdul Baha's successor. 
Next. Bahaya Hanum's vigilance kept Mirza Muhammad Ali at bay. Mirza Muhammad Ali vainly imagined that with Abdul Baha's ascension, he could realize his long coveted hope of becoming a recognized leader of the worldwide Baha'i community. Upon hearing the news, according to a well-informed resident believer in those days in Haifa, he proceeded to the master's house, probably in the hope of rehabilitating himself and establishing his authority. The greatest holy leaf met him at the entrance to the house and told him he was not welcomed inside. Disappointed, he retraced his steps, intent, intent on pursuing other means to achieve this purpose. Baha'i Hanum's first message to American Baha'is was about how to deal with the misinformation spread by the covenant breakers. Shukri Afandi had not yet reached the Holy Land when Baha'i Hanum sent a message to the American believers. It read, now is the period of great test. The friends should be firm and united in defending the cause. Naqazim, that's covenant breakers, starting activities through press and other channels all over the world. Select committee of wise, cool heads to handle press propaganda in America. The arrival of Shoketan. A means of travel between Great Britain and the Holy Land was by sea in those days, and the voyage took many days. Shoghi Afandi, accompanied by Lady Blomfield, arrived in Haifa on the afternoon of December 29, 1921. The greatest holy leaf, with a broken heart and frail arms, received Shoghi Afandi in the embrace of her boundless love, bowing before his authority, setting a shining example for all to follow. At that time, as it was said earlier, Shoghi Effendi was 24 years old, the greatest holy leaf, 75. Next. The reading and announcement of Abdul Baha's will and testament. You see, the greatest holy leaf had not done anything with regard to the contents of the will and testament of Abdul Baha until Shoghi Effendi arrived in Haifa. Five days after Shoghi Effendi's arrival in Haifa, the master's will and testament was read aloud to nine men, most of them members of the family of Abdul Baha, and its seals, signatures, and his writing throughout in his own hand shown to them. The guardian gave instructions that a true copy should then be made by one of those present, who was a believer from Persia. Abdul Baha's will was read on the 7th of January, 1922, at his house in the presence of Baha'is from Persia, India, Egypt, England, Italy, Germany, America, and Japan. This information is contained in the book, the great book that Amatul Baha Hanum has written, entitled The Priceless Pair. On the 40th day, some Baha'is and many notables, including the governor of Haifa, gathered in the hall of the master's home, were first served lunch and then held a large meeting in that same hall, at which 
speeches were made in honor of the departed master and the provisions of his will and testament and his will were announced. Next. Here is the house of Abdul Baha. And the part that you see above, the apartment above, is what was added to the original house as a dwelling place for Shogh Efendi. Because when he returned to Haifa, he really didn't have a place of his own. And this is the house where the will and testament were announced, and also the house where later the apartment was built on top of a part of the house where Shogh Efendi resided. Next. On January 7, 1922, Baha'i Khanum sent two cables to the friends in Iran. So you see, even after Shogh Efendi had arrived in Haifa, he authorized the greatest holy leaf to send these cables. She says memorial meetings all over the world have been held. The Lord of all the worlds in his will and testament has revealed his instructions. Copy will be sent, inform believers. The second cable also to Iran says will and testament forwarded. Shogh Efendi, center of the cause. This is the first time when the Iranian believers learn about Shoghi Afandi succeeding Abdul Baha as the guardian of the cause of God. Nine days later, that is on January 16th, 1922, she sent to the United States the following message. In will, Shoghi Afandi appointed guardian of the cause and head of the House of Justice, informed American friends. The reason it took so many days after the Iranian believers had been informed, maybe the requirement of translating uh, parts of the will and testament. This is only a conjecture on my part. There may have been other reasons, but anyway, that's what the documentation says. Um, the next one, Baha'i Hanum's main concerns after Abdul Baha's ascension. Baha'i Hanum's attention was focused on two major concerns immediately after Abdul Baha's ascension. One, to protect the Baha'i community at home and abroad from the covenant breakers' fresh intrigues. Two, to provide solace and assistance to the beloved guardian who felt overwhelmed under the weight of the grievous loss he had sustained and the colossal responsibilities placed on his shoulders. Judging by the outcome, also by Shoghi Fendi's own assessment of the services she rendered, she did remarkably went well on both fronts. Next. Legal challenge to Shoghi Fendi's authority. Well, Mirza Muhammad Ali, the archbreaker of the covenant, is not going to go away quietly. And what he did, the first legal step he took was challenging Shoghif and his authority by claiming that he was actually the rightful successor of Abdul Baha, according to Baha'u'llah's Book of the Covenant. According to Amatul Baha Ruhi Khanum, Mirza Muhammad Ali applied to the civil authorities 
to turn over the custodianship of Baha'u'llah's shrine to him on the grounds that he was Abdul Baha's lawful successor. The British authorities refused on the grounds that it appeared to be a religious issue. Mirza Muhammad Ali then appealed to the Muslim religious head and asked the Mufti of Akka to take formal charge of Baha'u'llah's shrine. This dignitary, however, said he did not see how he could do this as the Baha'i teachings were not in conformity with Sharia law. All other avenues having failed he sent his younger brother, Badiullah, with some of their supporters to visit the shrine of Baha'u'llah. Next. Where on Tuesday, 30th January, they forcibly seized the keys of the holy tomb from the Baha'i caretaker, thus asserting Muhammad Ali's right to be the lawful custodian of his father's resting place. This unprincipled act created such a commotion in the Baha'i community that the governor of Akka ordered the keys to be handed over to the authorities, posted guards at the shrine, but went no further, refusing to turn the keys to either party. The problem was unresolved when Shoghe Afandi, when Shoghe Afandi's declining health forced him to go abroad. Okay, let's see what Shoghe Afandi's message was before he left for Europe. Shoghe Afandi left for Europe on April 5, 1922. Before departure, he penned a message in Persian. The English translation reads, this servant, after that grievous event and great calamity, the ascension of His Holiness Abdul Baha to the Abha Kingdom, has been so stricken with grief and pain and so entangled in the troubles created by the enemies of the cause of God that I consider that my presence here at such a time and in such an atmosphere is not in accordance with the fulfillment of my important and sacred duties. For this reason, unable to do otherwise, I have left for a time the affairs of the cause, both at home and abroad, under the supervision of the Holy Family and the headship of the greatest holy leaf. Until by the grace of God, having gained health, strength, self-confidence, and spiritual energy, and having taken into my hands in accordance with my aim and desire, entirely and regularly, the work of service, I shall attain to my utmost spiritual hope and aspiration. Shoghe Fandi's letter to the governor of Phoenicia. So here Shoghe Fandi is going away. He informs the believers by writing a letter in Persian and translating into English so that the Baha'is all over the world know about his going away for health reasons. He also writes a letter to the governor of Phoenicia, informing him of what, uh, of who, be, who will be in charge during his absence. Shoghe Fandi wrote to Colonel Symes, the governor of Phoenicia, before leaving for Europe, introducing Bahia Khanum as his representative during his absence. This is a part of that letter. As I am compelled to leave Haifa for reasons of health, I have named as my representative 
during my absence, the sister of Abdul Baha Bahia Khanum, to assist her to conduct the affairs of the Baha'i movement in this country and elsewhere, I have also appointed a committee of the sons-in-law of Abdul Baha. Then he says the chairman of this committee to be soon elected by its members with the signature of Baha'i Khanum has my authority to transact any affairs that may need to be considered and decided during my absence. Extracts from Baha'i Khanum's general letters in 1922. This is during the absence of Shoghi Fandi and that is the, okay, this is the first uh, extract that I'm introducing um, by putting a foreword to it. Baha'i Khanum addressed the Baha'i world immediately after the beloved guardian left for Germany to seek treatment. The typewritten letter in English is signed in Persian Baha'iye. You see, she signed her own name as Baha'i and sealed it. Her seal also reads Baha'i. So her letter dated 8 April reads in part, since the ascension of our beloved Abdul Baha, Shoghi Afandi has been moved so deeply that he has sought the necessary quiet in which to meditate upon the vast task ahead of him. And it is to accomplish this, that he has temporarily left these regions. During his absence, he has appointed me as his representative. And while he is occupied in this great endeavor, the family of Abdul Baha is assured that you will all strive to advance triumphantly the cause of Baha'u'llah. The next, in May 1922, Baha'i Khanum informed the believers of the covenant breakers increasing assaults on the cause of God after Abdul Baha's ascension. She then apprised them of the circumstances leading to the seizure of the key of the most holy shrine. It means that immediately the believers were not informed about the seizure of the key of the shrine of Baha'u'llah. It took a while and uh, it was in May that Baha'i Khanum sent a letter informing the Baha'is of what had happened. Then she set out details of the actions taken, then described what the government had suggested be done to bring about the resolution of the case. And she says, now after the passage of four months, the government has rendered its verdict to the effect that the question should be put to the Baha'i community and that whatever decision the Baha'is arrive at will be conclusive. If the Baha'i community considers Mirza Muhammad Ali to be excommunicated, then he has no right whatever to the takeover. After explaining the procedures that were to be followed, she says, it should be the request, therefore, of Baha'is of all countries, both men and women, in every important center, wherever they may reside throughout the world, that the officials of his Britannic Majesty government, Majesty's government in Palestine, its headquarters being Jerusalem, issue a categorical order that the key of the holy tomb 
which is the point of adoration and the sanctuary of all Baha'is in the world, be restored to his eminence, Shoghi Effendi, the chosen branch, and in this way to render the Baha'i community, whether of the East or of the West, more appreciative than ever of British justice. The message is to be signed by the representatives on, of known followers. Representative, representatives and known followers of the Baha'i faith in that city. So you see, she clearly explains what the Baha'is were to do in order to convince the governor that really Shoghi Effendi was the one who was in charge and who had been appointed by Abdul Baha as the guardian of the cause of God. Next, the governor's response, which was dated 30 October, 1922. Sorry, this is the letter of inquiry that the Baha'i Hanum sent on 30th October, 1922. The response of the governor to, to the greatest holy leaves letter of inquiry was dated 30th October of the same year, 1922. And it reads in part, to judge from messages received from a number of Baha'is centers, it would appear that they endorse and uphold the provisions of the will of the late Sir Abdul Baha. And as soon as the government will be, and as soon as the Congress aforementioned has actually met and given its decision, the government will be prepared to entertain its final recommendations. In the meantime, if it is possible to find an individual whose provisional custody of the key of the shrine will be offensive to no section of Baha'is, I shall be only too glad to hand over the key to him until such time as the Congress has met and made its final recommendations in the matter. You notice in this response, the governor brings up the point in the will and testament of Abdul Baha that speaks of the institution of the Universal House of Justice. Actually, it's the guardianship the institution of guardianship and the institution of the Universal House of Justice that are the twin successors of Abdul Baha. So they are highlighting this point and arguing that this Congress needs to give its verdict to decide, which obviously at that time, with no preparations and no foundation, could not be, um, could not come into existence. And probably there was a lot of back and forth explaining and uh, showing evidences that this was under consideration and was, going, and was going to get done in time. I think this is what the Congress in, that is mentioned in this letter refers to. Okay, let's see to the next slide. Let's see what happened that they actually restored the key of the shrine to its original caretaker. Persistent actions before and after Shoghi Pandi's return in mid-December 1922 yielded the outcome the Baha'is sought. G, on March 14, 1923, the district governor, G.S. Sines, instructed the sub-governor at Aikep to return the key of the tomb of Baha'u'llah to a Sayyid Abu Qasim, its original caretaker, from whom the covenant breakers forcibly had seized it nearly 14 months earlier. So can you imagine during that time? 
for 14 months, the Holy Family, the members of the community, nobody had access to the Shrine of Baha'u'llah. It took 14 months for the key to be restored. Next, eruption of hostilities in Iran. Well, this was an ongoing thing, the persecution of Baha'is in Iran. And when Abdul Baha passed away, the traditional enemies of the faith in Iran thought, okay, this was the opportunity to increase pressure on the Baha'is and intensify persecutions. They intensified the maltreatment of Baha'is in that land, inflicting fresh tribulations on the defenseless believers in the country. They began a campaign, a campaign of, of incitement against the Baha'is in several towns and cities. Baha'i Khanum apprised the believers of this situation. Next. So she wrote a letter to the Baha'is of the world probably, but um, this is the one that she wrote to the American believers. Um, she sent detail in a, a detailed letter to the Assembly of the Believers in America. After explaining the seriousness of the situation of the friends in Iran, she said, during occurrences of this kind, it's incumbent upon the believers in other countries to immediately adopt prudent and reasonable measures that through wise methods, such fires may be put out. And she further stated that at this time, it's urgently needful, and it is the request of this grieving servant that the assembly of the believers in that area act at once and take the case to the ambassador of the Iranian government. In the same letter, she described what the petition was to include, then asked, if it be possible, you should make this same representation through your own ambassador in Tehran so that he may direct the attention of the Iranian authorities to these persecutions and awaken that government to the possibility of divine retribution and to the shameful stigma occasioned by such actions directed against this innocent community by the heedless and ignorant amongst the mass of the people. This is a saga that we are so familiar with even today, what is happening in that land and how the believers are often used as scapegoats. So that is what happened during the time Baha'i Khanum was in charge of the affairs as representative of Shabbat Afendi. And this is the action she took. Okay. Then on top of everything that she was doing, she had great concern for Shabbat Afendi's well-being. Shabbat Afendi had left the Holy Land on this trip that was to take probably a short time, she thought, but it took a long time. The prolonged absence of Shoghe Fendi from the Holy Land caused the greatest holy leaf deep concern, according to the hand of the cause of God. Amatul Baharuhi Khanum, in the autumn of 1922, the greatest holy leaf, deeply distressed, by Shoghe Fendi's long absence, sent members of his family to find him and plead with him to come back to the Holy Land. In the street of a small village in the mountains, as he returned in the evening, 
from one of his all day walks, Shoghi Effendi, to his great surprise, found his mother looking for him. She had come all the way from Palestine for this purpose, accompanied by another member of the master's family. With tears, she informed him of the distress of Bahia Khanum, the family and, the, and friends, and persuaded him to return and assume his rightful place. Next. <clears throat> you should know that Shok uh, Efendi, okay, let me read this to you. It, it explains. After eight and a half months absence, Shok Efendi returned to the Holy Land on 15 December 1922. Unfortunately, his health deter deteriorated in early summer of 1923 causing the greatest holy leaf and other members of his family deep concern. They pleaded with him to go away for a time to recuperate. His trips abroad in 1923 and 1924 each lasted several months. During those absences, he entrusted the affairs of the faith to the competent care of Baha'i Khan who, according to Amatul Baharu Yekhanum, was an incarnation of Abdul Baha's all-encompassing tenderness and love. For him, she had always been, next to his grandfather, the most beloved person in the world. Referring to the close bond that existed between Shoghi Effendi and his great aunt, Ruhi Khanum says, next. So close was the communion between Shoghi Effendi and his great aunt that over and over, in cables and other communications, particularly during the early years of his guardianship, he included her with himself in such phrases as assure us, the greatest holy leaf and I, we, and so on. In a cable sent in 1931, he even signs it, Bahie Shori. 1931 was just one year before the greatest holy leaf passed away. So during that whole decade, thank goodness, Shoghi Effendi had this great arm to rely on. And she was so trustworthy that he could leave everything to her. Even when he appointed a committee, he said that their communications had to be signed by the greatest holy league. As we know, the members of that committee, in time, they broke the covenant. And it was only Baha'i Khanum who remained steadfast and a strong supporter of Shoghi Effendi to the last breath. Another thing that Amatul Baha'i Khanum says is this. She says nothing could be more revealing of this intense love he had for her than the fact that on the day we were married, it was to her room where everything is preserved as it was in her days. Standing beside her bed that the guardian went to have the simple Baha'i marriage ceremony of hand in hand performed and we each repeated the words in Arabic. We will all, we will all verily abide by the will of God. It's important to mention that 
The greatest holy relief during Shobe Pandi's absence did not only deal with matters that were going on in the Baha'i world. When Shobe Pandi was away, Baha'i Khanum was not concerned only with the worldwide affairs of the Baha'i community. In addition to members of Abdul Baha's immediate and extended family, there was a sizable local Baha'i community that looked to her for guidance, shared with her the difficulties they experienced, and sought her advice in solving problems of various kinds. A resident Baha'i at the time in, in the Holy Land writes, when the beloved guardian was away on a trip the greatest holy leaf carried out all the work of the faith in the Holy Land, be it big or small. The same believer writes, next, I believe that only the greatest holy leaf truly knew the rank and station of the beloved guardian. And he truly knew had true rank and station, these two holy beings most certainly loved one another dearly. The greatest holy leaf passed away on July 15, 1932. Shok Effendi was then 35 years old, well known as the guardian of the cause of God, the expounder of the words of God, and the recognized leader of the faithful followers of Baha'u'llah in every land. Baha'i Khanum's true word and station is best understood through the study of the moving tributes Shok Effendi has penned in her honor. They manifest the many aspects of her sacrificial life, her towering personality, and sterling character. They reveal the depth of his gratitude to a great aunt who stood by his side, no matter how tumultuous the storm was. In one of his tributes, Shoghaya Fandi writes, after the ascension of Abdul Baha to the realm of the all glorious, that light of the concourse on high enfolded me, helpless as I was, in the embrace of her love and with incomparable pity and tenderness, persuaded, guided, and urged me on to the requirements of servitude. The very elements of this frail being were leavened with her love, refreshed by her companionship, sustained by her eternal spirit. And Shobe Afandi built a monument that Amatol Baharuhi Khanum referred to it as a monument of love, a temple of love, and placed it in a spot which is the focal center of the international institutions of the Baha'i faith with the Universal House of Justice, its seat built on the top of the ark right behind this monument. The last slide I have is a depiction by, of the greatest holy leaf by a Western pilgrim. I thought it was, it's so telling, I couldn't avoid including it here. Ella Cooper writes, next to meeting the beloved master himself, was the privilege of meeting his glorious sister, Bahia Khanum, known as the greatest holy leaf. 
tall, slender, and of noble bearing. Her beautiful face was the feminine counterpart of Abdul Baha's. The lines of suffering and privation softened by the patient sweetness of the mouth. The dominating brow bespeaking intellect and will lighted by the wonderful understanding eyes in form like those of Abdul Baha, but deep blue rather than hazel. Watching their expressive changes, as one moment they darkened with sympathy or pain, the next moment sparkled with laughter and humor, only served to deepen the impression of her irresistible spiritual attraction. Thank you for listening, and that's where I end the presentation. Thank you so much, Baharie. That was really uh, incredible. Um, so many details, so much information that I'm sure many people weren't aware of, even though it's actually most of, most of it is widely available. But putting it all together for us really was really very inspiring. And uh, I, I thank you very much. The, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the time that Shoghi Effendi retired to Switzerland. And do you know the exactly how long he was gone in 23 and 24? Did it get shorter each time? Do we know? Um, probably, but the first one took eight and a half months. Right. And that was the crucial period in almost immediately after Abdul Baha's ascension. Also, it explains the challenges that he faced, just other than being in charge of the affairs of the Baha'i world and things. It's the, the atmosphere in Haifa. All these elderly Baha'is, you know, sons of Abdul Baha and his probably brother in law. Sayyid Asadullah Isfahani, and all of those people, including his own parents. I mean, he went away, you know, uh, and comes back, the parents are there, the cousins, the siblings, and he had no place of his own and to occupy. So there were a lot of challenges. Yeah. It reminds me a bit of Baha'u'llah's Kurdistan mm -hmm. retreat or Jesus's retreat into the wilderness. Um, Abdul Baha was in a different position because he had years of preparation before he became the head of the faith. Good and God. he had been his father's chief lieutenant and assistant for decades. The friends knew him well. He was highly respected in the community. He was older. Also, he wasn't a, a young whippersnapper, exactly. uh, but being 24 years old and being uh, away in England and uh, not being you know, well known by a large number of, of the friends and being surrounded by an older generation, all of whom remembered him as a little boy, uh, must have been an extremely difficult situation. And on top of that, suddenly having all of that responsibility on his shoulders was well nigh overwhelming. Do we know how his health deteriorated? What what does that mean? Do you know? Sleeplessness maybe or something like that? We don't know. Well, Amatul Baharuya Khanum says when you know she, he went first to Germany for treatment, uh, he had said that he had no uh, reflexes, reflexes, you know, they they didn't know how they could, you know, uh, re-establish that and uh, it was only when he went into the wilderness and the long walks in nature that helped him at last at last but uh, he started in germany yeah that's interesting no reflexes is that's yeah yeah that's quite quite dramatic and hearing all the things that uh, that um, Bahi Khanum did to protect the faith is also quite, quite remarkable. 
Um, I guess I had known that she was the one who told everybody uh, that he was the guardian, but I was unaware of the fact that she already knew. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's also mentioned in God Passes By? I mean, in in um, in the Priceless Pearl. Um, I have seen it in writing. I can't tell you exactly, but she definitely was the one who knew. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's... And you know, when Abdul Baha wrote the first part of the Will and Testament, Shukri Fendi was, what, six, seven years old. Yeah. So he must have also confided other things in greatest holy leaf in case then the covenant breakers were really after him to send him uh, to Fizan or uh, get rid of him, uh, how she was to deal with the uh, affairs or whatever. So it makes sense that, uh, yeah, she knew. Yeah, it's really quite amazing. We have a few items here in the chat. Um, Thank you for presenting this. Do we have any indication of the exact birth date of the greatest holy leaf? And do we know around how old she was when she decided that she didn't want to marry? We know she was born in 1846, I think, two years, three years younger than Abdul Baha. We don't know the exact date, but we know the year at least. And exactly at what age she asked, uh, asked Baha'u'llah that, um, you know, she didn't want to get, get married. We don't know. It could have been in Adrianople, but it's just a guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This, uh, I think Lady Blomfield in her book, Chosen Highway, it talks about a man who had told her that, uh, he had heard that Hanum was very lovely. And uh, Lady Blomfield asks him, what do you think? And he says, I never met her. You know, we, we couldn't see women. So he, he said he had heard that she was a very, very lovely person. And in those days, girls married young, you know, 15, 16. Yeah, that's true. Another uh, another question. Uh, my understanding is that one of the earliest photos of the greatest holy leaf was taken in her in he says his forties. I think it means her forties. But is there any indication of any photos taken of her in her twenties? Perhaps in Adrianople, did she have a passport picture like Baha'u'llah and Abu Baha did? Perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I'm not sure if women had passport photos, and in those days they didn't have really a passport, a document that they were accompanying, you know, the, the head of the family. So I, I haven't seen anything. They, the only one I have seen is the one with a long garment and next to her is a little table with some flowers on it. That's, I think, the youngest we have. Mm, interesting. When studying her life, did you learn anything interesting or surprising? <laughs> I definitely I found it surprising that she was that deeply involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the faith. I knew in general, but looking at the history of women in religion, this is incredible. Yeah. appointing a woman to represent the center of the faith during his travels to the West, during his own lifetime. And then Shok Efendi continuing that pattern, leaving her in charge and giving her the light of signature. I mean, all those men were much more educated than the greatest holy leaf as far as the secular education is concerned. And she does it so well. Where in the history you can find a woman, no matter that had this responsibility and carried it out so well. Yeah, that's very true. 
I remember reading the volume of the translation of her writings when it came out in uh, 1983, 82, 82, the 50th anniversary of her passing. And I was amazed by how beautifully she wrote. Um, she was a very effective writer um, and, and quite eloquent, at least in the English translation. And that in itself is uh, a real testimony to her, her self-education in, uh, in the household of the manifestation of God. Yeah, that's true. She had very little education, secular education. She says she didn't have time. She was yeah. always so busy. And yet, yes. Yep. Yeah. Self-educated. Rebecca asks this question. Thank you most kindly for this presentation. I am part of an online group studying your book, Mrs. Uh, Ma'ani, which, as you know, is entitled The Leaves of the Twin Divine Trees. The group members continue continually express their appreciation of your work. I was blessed enough to meet you once at Greenacre. It is very nice to see you again online. Thanks again for your tireless research and work. My pleasure. Really, yeah. truly. There were lots of things I thought I was going to do in my life. After I realized the gap in the history of our faith for information about women, I decided to get involved with this work and I've never stopped. Yeah, oh, that's very good. And Sandra says, when Shoghi Effendi first came back from Switzerland and had no place to live, did he stay at the Greatest Holy Leaf's house? Where did he stay? The Greatest Holy Leaf stayed in the master's house. You know, those who have been on pilgrimage <laughs> know number seven, number seven Abdul Baha's house on Hapar Sim Street. And her room there still, you can go and visit. So she lived there, Monira Khanum lived there, and uh, it was a place also frequented by the members of the family. Uh, so that, that's where I think, uh, at least initially, Shoghi Fendi arrived there, uh, whether he stayed all the time that he was in Haifa, because his aunt's houses, two of them, lived close by. Mm -hmm. And there is a mention that when the Will and Testament of Abdul Baha was read to the uh, people in the master's house. He couldn't be present uh, and he, he excused himself and he was in the house of his aunt at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't really know the details, but the greatest Holy Leaf realized he needed a place of his own and that's why that apartment was built. Yeah, you know, I've seen the room of the greatest holy leaf there and that big public space. Mm -hmm. But behind the public space, are there are there a lot of other rooms? Do you know what else is there on the first floor? Are there other bedrooms? There's a kitchen, I suppose, back there. Yeah, there is a tea room. There's a tea room that you enter from the main hall. It's uh, opposite the entrance, the tea room. Then uh, there are rooms on both sides. Um, of course, on the right side, as you enter, you see the room of Abdul Baha. And then there is a corridor before you get to the room of Abdul Baha. There is a corridor that leads you to the room of the greatest holy leaf. On the other side, there is a similar, you know, arrangement. There were rooms that when my father was in the presence of Abdul Baha, a pilgrim six months before Abdul Baha's ascension, when she explained, I realized that there was a room uh, on the other side that Abdul Baha received the pilgrims. And uh, yeah, there are a number of rooms. And then there was a room that uh, uh, Ruhi Khanum referred to it as Millie's book room, Millie Collins. Uh, she stayed sometime in that house and had her own room. So. And of course, then there is a corridor which takes you out to the back side of the house where the kitchen is and where Shorshid, you know, Hanum's maid had her room there and Fujita, 
yeah, it, it's quite a complex. Mm. I take it you did not meet Shoghi Effendi. I did not, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's too bad you didn't stop in Haifa on your way to. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> that was after Shoghi Effendi had passed away. I went to Kenya oh. in 1960. It was three years after Shoghi Effendi had passed away. We have another question here from Rhonda. We know that the coffin of the Bob was hidden under the bed of the greatest holy leaf for some time, and the greatest holy leaf did not want to sleep over the coffin. Do we know where the greatest holy leaf would then sleep? Was it on the floor? <laughs> it was in the house of Abdullah Pasha when the <laughs> remains of the Bob arrived. And uh, it's the, the box, the casket, was, I mean, the greatest holy leaf was the most trustworthy person who could have the remains in her room after for 50 years that they had tried so hard to take care of it and make sure that it would get to the World Center. Um, we know where the bed is because you can go and visit now. Um, but the details, you know, sometimes the pilgrims exaggerate or have their own ideas. I really don't know. That Khanum refused to sleep on her bed because, you know, it's actually a big size room if it was for security reasons, I don't know. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Those are all of our questions right now. Perhaps we will get one or two more. Um, one thing that it occurs to me is that you don't have much to say about the greatest holy leaf when you get into the, the, late, the early 30s, late 20s. Is her, was her health declining quite was, noticeably at that point? Mm -hmm. It was declining. I had, uh, you know, a portion about the mansion of Bahji when uh, Shoghi Effendi arranged for the covenant breakers to leave because uh, their house needed to be repaired. And they sent a message to Shoghi Effendi, the house needs to be repaired. And Shoghi Effendi said, I am happy to repair it, but you have to get out first. Mm -hmm. And after they left, Shoghi Pandi had it repaired and asked, as you know, the government to recognize it as a historic place. So the covenant breakers couldn't come back. So when Shoghi Pandi um, refurbished and refurnished the place, he said he wanted Bahi Khanu to be the first one to visit the mansion. And the greatest holy leaf was so emotional and she was constantly repeating a sentence, oh Baha'u'llah, look at your chosen branch, oh Abdul Baha, look what he has done. He is killing himself with all the work that he does. And that was in 1928. Wow. Which means four years before her departure. And according to Shoghi Effendi, after Adrianople, actually, she contracted probably pneumonia or something mm. that affected her hair, which steadily declined. And uh, yeah, but mm. it, as, as far as the Shoghi Effendi is concerned, she was always alert to his needs and what needed to be done. And, uh, it's amazing that Shoghi Effendi had this greatest holy leaf really to be the person who can yeah. who could console him and do whatever she could for him. His rock. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, another question we've just received. What was her relationship with Monere Khanum? Very good. They were like two loving sisters. It's amazing. I mean, it speaks to the kind of personality that the greatest holy leaf had, that she could get along with people so well. And with even the family. You know, Shoghi Effendi, after 
the greatest holy leaf passed away, these members of the family, including Shoghef and his sisters, by marrying in covenant breakers' families, they were all after greatest holy leaf had passed away. Hmm. And she and Monira Khanum, for nearly 50 years, they lived together in the same house. And Monira Khanum knew her place. The greatest holy leaf always took precedence in everything. Mm -hmm. She understood it and she was happy. And after she passed away, Moni Rehanum was really, felt the loneliness mm -hmm. and in her letters of lament explained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. When did Moni Rehanum pass? I think 39. 39. After the guardian's marriage. Yes, yes, she was alive, I think. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, and did did the uh, daughters of Abu Baha? You said that the greatest holy leaf really kind of helped to. Uh, you imply that it kind of helped to steady them, and keep them in the community. You think, and then it yeah, because the reason they brought the covenant was that their children, including guardian sisters, right, married. The members of the Afna, you know, Sayyid Ali Afna, yeah. his daughters. And Shoghi Effendi he was unhappy that they gave even consent for these marriages to take place. And uh, it was a huge test. But uh, all of the announcements about their being declared covenant breakers, the dates are after the greatest holy leaf had passed away. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Well, we don't have any, oh, we just, another one just popped in here. Can you talk more about the son-in-law's participation during the uh, period right after the reading of the will and testament? Do you know anything about their role? Mm -hmm. Well, their role, uh, Shoghi Effendi put them on the committee that he formed to, um, to look after the affairs and under the greatest holy leaves leadership. The, he, she was the leader and they were there to help with consultation and doing things. And if they had to communicate in any way in writing, it was Bahai Khanum who had the right of signature. If it didn't carry his, her signature, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't really valid. That's my understanding of that arrangement. Did we, did we ever find out who they appointed as the or elected as the chair amongst themselves? I don't. Yeah, Shoghi Fandi refers to the chair being elected in his letter to the governor, but I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Interesting. Well, that seems to be the end of the questions. Um. And so we want to thank you again very, very much for this really fascinating presentation. I think that people will value and treasure it. And I think for years to be able to get this nice summary of her role in the guardianship and protecting Shoghi Effendi and, and nurturing him. So that really was a, really, I think, a, a fantastic presentation. And we're, we're in your debt for having given this to us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. I always jump on such opportunities. <laughs> good, good. Uh, to remind everybody again, in three weeks, we'll have a presentation about the tablet to Pope Pius IX by Shahrukh Mon Jozeb. Uh, and I want to again thank everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again at some point in the future. Goodbye. <laughs>